we thought that he had integrity and the ability to run this country. But what he has done to us is so pathetic that one of his ministers yesterday or two days ago confronted me on the radio station and he said 75 percent of this country, the are in consequential. So our today is a consequential takeover of the federal government territory. First palace I've been trained since I started campaigning five weeks ago. You have shown yourself to be a disruptor. You have disrupted the economic system in this country by putting away people who were thieves in our banking system. I also want to disrupt the political space in Nigeria. I am running to become the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in 2019. And I want to start. So we left Kano, drove again for several hours to Kaduna, and came to a town hall meeting at Iowa House. <laughs> the interesting thing is that uh, Kaduna city is a or state is a very polarized state, you know. There are people from Northern Kaduna and Southern Kaduna, Christians and Muslims, and some cases they actually don't see eye to eye. So, but here it was in this hall, Iowa Hall. The hall was filled to the brim, interestingly, by women. So, in the middle of the hall, you had the Christians, and to the left, you had Muslims. And all of it, all of these people coming together because of one purpose uh, to rescue and take Nigeria back from the old divisive politicians that uh, uh, destroyed the country. So when we started, they, they said we cannot go to Kano, that you dare not go to Kano because it's President Buhari's home. We came to Kano, we went there today, we went to see the area. People were heading up on the street. Not look back. Kaduna is going to happen. If we put our hands together, Ah. The 
Sahara Reporters publisher is now running for president. Ah, we are still working on a coalition of parties, but we've been going around. I coalition of parties. We have a bunch of parties that we're talking to. We want to form a mother. Why worry about a bunch of parties? Why not go to the regional party? Which is the new party? That's PRP. PRP. Okay, so yes, now we are talking. <laughs> No, 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 no. Okay, we don't. Oh, no. But this is good enough. This is good enough. Okay. Okay. So I think I can chop that. Uh, sure. <laughs> it's on if you want it. Yes, uh, good evening. I think these are the early birds that use the bike, you know, in the traffic to beat. The craziness that we have in this functionality that we have in Lagos. You're welcome again to the business roundtable with your and um, I want to assure you that tonight we're going to see a part of him that we've not seen before. You know, um, we're looking at the most sensitive aspect of our economy, which is the middle class. When you look at a country like Nigeria, with a population that is majorly um, Rife with youth in between the ages of 18 and 35, running into hundreds of uh, seven, seven, tens of thousands. Of, you know, you begin to ask yourself, why are we not engaging? What is the plan of government? You know, towards ensuring that they engage these people to, you know, open up Nigeria for better. And then we we'll begin to see or hear things like. Uh, digitization of the middle class, cutting off of the middlemen, uh, the youth are lazy, you know, things that begin to show that um, the middle class are going to be are endangered and they are going to be wiped out. Previous administration before this one tried as much as possible to focus on agriculture, forgetting about the middle class. That's one of the things that pissed them off the most. This administration totally went for the jugular. They wanted to wipe out the entire middle class with unfavorable policies and the rest of them. And it will be wonderful to ask ourselves questions and what exactly is the plan of what should we be expecting from a new administration? What should we be expecting from somebody who is vying you know, to serve in the highest office in the land? What plans? What plans does he have for the middle class, for the working class, for the innovators amongst us? And that's one of the things we want to explore. We want to look at it across sector. We want to look at how we're going to end job creation. It's not about creating a group of people who will be hailing government and taking money on a monthly basis, or they'll be deployed for an election meeting, or whatever. We're looking at actual, actual plans 
you know, that we can actually run. Remember, you take it back, movement, or the AAC as a party, it's not just a political party. If you take it back, movement as a word is a movement. So whether election is running or election has finished running, it goes on. In other words, if there's any plan that we ask that we're going to do, continue to run those plans, whether the government of the day agree with it or not. Because it is about the future of coming generation. We are taking back our lives from politicians. We are taking back our lives from people who don't care about us, but feed off our blood. So in furtherance of this, I would like to invite uh, to, uh, invite to the stage and the podium Dr. Malcolm Fabi, the DG of the URA campaign for the Thank you so much. We want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, <coughs> my name is uh, Dr. Malcolm Fabi, as uh, I was just introduced earlier. And before I speak, before I go on, I think it is only proper that we bring up to the stage the man that gave us the job of developing uh, the policy overview that we're going to give you now. Um, as, uh, as we were told uh, just now uh, by Mr. Wosonya, what has happened with a lot of our past governments, in fact, with all of our past governments, is that they have neglected not just the masses, they have also neglected the middle class. And no nation progresses when it neglects any part uh, of its people. So what we want to do today is to provide Nigerians with an opportunity to understand the thinking behind the programs. When we started out, we started out with a lot, number of unique ideas. We're glad to tell you that today a lot of those ideas that people thought were extreme are actually mainstream. When we said we were going to give people a hundred thousand naira minimum wage, people were apoplectic. Uh, now it is mainstream. More than a couple of political parties, in fact, have picked it up. When we said ranching was the way to go, if we were to solve the farmer. Dr. Malcolm Fabi, great thanks to uh, Sega also, yeah, a great friend of ours, Sega Link, for helping out uh, to put this together. No thanks to Lagos for making it impossible for uh, all the people that are supposed to be here tonight. I hope we'll make it because of uh, the traffic jam that's uh, associated with uh, this city. It's an impossible city uh, to live in or work in, as you guys know. Uh, as I said, we have some of the best plans to grow our Nigerian economy, to diversify it, and to create a real middle class, not a class left in the middle of nowhere, uh, which is what we have now. And uh, one of the three pillars of our economic agenda, or even our entire manifesto, was to ensure that we guarantee security to Nigerians. And when we talk about security, a lot of people think that we're talking about physical security alone. It's way beyond that. We are talking about what war might likely be war waged in the cyberspace. And it's a matter of time before that happens. So if any nation that is not prepared for that kind of security is incapable of uh, securing its borders, because it's nice kind of security breaches we are going to be experiencing is such that your physical borders also cannot save you. Um, 
And you know, beyond that, uh, we have discussed. Uh, that is based on PowerPoint presentations or those economic models that are not only outdated but that the people who actually sent us those economic models have come to apologize mm -hmm. that those economic models did not work and they, they are not going back to work for us. So there must be something domestic about the intelligence that is driving our economic model. So what we're talking about is a new political economy, not political philosophy. I mean, not economic philosophy, and you guys heard us had that conversation during the last debate. You know, when people were talking about high valuing uh, political, I mean, economic uh, yeah, philosophy. philosophy. Um, and, you know, it took us just one argument to knock it out. That, you know, if you don't have power, electricity, you can't, and philosophy is useless. And um, after that is, of course, the restructuring of the country. And we are very clear that we will structure this country on all levels. But the first restructuring that must happen in Nigeria is the restructuring of the economy and the restructuring of the politics in such a way that the people for whom restructuring is met, young people, are the ones driving the restructuring process. As it is today, if they call a restructuring meeting, you and I will not be allowed into the place. It's a meeting of, uh, you know, well, you know, uh, in America, they call them cougars. <laughs> you know, uh, they, it's a meeting of people who claim to do are old but want to pretend that uh, they are young or you know they are romancing uh, youthful ideas. So it's not going to work for us. And we have discussed health, education, agriculture, and tourism. And recently, we started asking another T to it, which is technology because all of this will be driven by technology. So we're here tonight uh, to take you through our economic policy. One of the things we also have told people repeatedly is that we're not working anymore. And that is why we have such an effective campaign. You know, We ran what can be referred to as a low budget campaign, probably the lowest for the kind of impact we achieved between February last year and February this year. We've done this for a year. Uh, and you look at the budget, you will know that you know, if you want to set up a low budget airline, you better talk to us. Right. If you want to set up a low budget government, you better talk to us. Right. You know, we have been able to demonstrate that whatever we get as a new government, we'll be able to manage it to achieve the most, even when we have the least. That's what we did and demonstrated with our campaign, the Take It Back our movement and our party. As we speak today, we are going into an election in four days' time, and our political party account still has 3 million 600,000 naira. We haven't touched a dime in our political party. We've been raising money through the presidential campaign account to run all activities, and we raise money on a daily basis. We spend and we have left, and we do great things, traveling to 34 states across Nigeria traveling in, in almost seven countries, you know, we went to pretty much every continent uh, to campaign uh, to people, both at home and in the diaspora. We did over 200 events, and we spent so far less than 120 million naira in a year. Yes. Probably what the PDP spent to date in the Lagos rally that I held failed spectacularly. I'm 
to a private spend even more than that. So, uh, without much ado, let me hand you over to Dr. Malcolm Fabi, who will uh, take us through the digital presentation of uh, what our economic blueprint is looking like. Uh, whatever you're seeing here is just uh, uh, an icing on a real cake. And uh, we've always promised that whenever we are sharing the national cake again in Nigeria, the celebrants will be there. Yeah. Before now, <laughs> they are always sharing the cake when the, without the celebrant. Thank you so much for giving me a welcome. Thank you very much, uh, the next president of the Federal Republic. Can you please uh, get it back to some clarity? Let me take it back. Take it back. Okay. <laughs> take it back. So, over the next uh, maybe 30 to 45 minutes, uh, what I'll do is I'll take you through the economic <coughs> programs of the African Action Congress and the manifesto of the Shore 2019 campaign. Um, when Shore made the decision to run, uh, the first thing he did was he made a couple of phone calls. Um, I don't know what number I was in the list of people he was calling, but he, he, he made a call. And every person he called very quickly began calling one another because we were incredibly excited. Uh, in my generation, and for those of us that are in the youthful generation, um, I think if there's one person that has exemplified courage, consistency, capability, it is Shogure. I got to know him 30 years ago as an undergraduate at the University of Lagos. Uh, in fact, I had the distinct honor of becoming Students' Union President after him. Those were massive shoes to fill. And when you've known somebody for 30 years and you've known their consistency, well, many of we started as activists. Many of us went into other careers, consulting, uh, academia. Uh, but even when he went into business, his business was the business of activism. He established a company called Sahara Reporters, which right now is one of the most recognizable Nigerian brands. Uh, it has been syndicated on BBC, CNN. Talk about there's no global organization that does not know who or what Sahara Reporters is. Um, so he has demonstrated over time that he is not only a consistent person and that he has integrity, but he's also incredibly sound from an economic perspective. He has run a business, he continues to run that business. And over the time that he has run that business in 2006, there are many businesses that have started and, and died in this country. He is continuing to try. So when he made the call, uh, what he wanted was for us to put together a policy team. And uh, we immediately set, um, we immediately pulled that team together. Our policy team had well over 20 people, uh, all of them global experts. Um, in my case, my expertise comes from management consulting. I work with a company called McKinsey. It's a, a pretty well-known management consultancy firm. Uh, attended the University of Lagos. I have a PhD from Cambridge. Um, I've worked both in engineering as well as in economics. And I've also spent time as a visiting professor at, uh, at the Lagos Business School, uh, where I used to teach marketing strategy um, almost about 10 years ago now. And so we put a team together. It was a global team, and it had experts in every area. And Shawane told us he wanted three things in his economic policy. He wanted to ensure that there was security. Not just security as he explained in terms of the safety of persons, but security in terms of, so think about food, he wanted food security. Think about social welfare, he wanted to make sure that there was security from that perspective for Nigerians. He wanted sustainability. What he asked for were programs that did not just create things, but programs that created things that could sustain themselves. So if we build a road, it must be a road that we can maintain. Whether that maintenance means that at the time we're conceiving of it, the way we conceive of how it should be built, the way we conceive of how it should be managed, should be rolled into the plan itself. And finally, he said he needed self-sufficiency. That at the end of four years, what he wanted to see was a situation in which Nigeria was self-sufficient. 
where we are no longer a nation that produces 2 million barrels of oil a day and imports 300,000 barrels of refined products, when we have four refineries that have a capacity of almost 450,000 barrels. So those were the three things he said he wanted to see in any plan we came up with. And it was a very iterative process. So there were a lot of conferences. We met physically a number of times. There were intense debates about how to move forward. Uh, but eventually, what we ended up with were 10 agenda items. Nigeria has a lot of problems. Uh, but what we found, uh, so the first thing we did was we did some polling. I mean, we had an intuition for what some of those challenges were. But we also went out and engaged with the Nigerian people to find out exactly uh, what those critical areas were. And this is what we call Spicer Heat. So when you look at each of those, so S-P-I-C-E-R-H-E-A-T, it spells out Spicer Heat. It's a program, a 10-point agenda that deals with security, power, infrastructure, corruption, and dealing with it decisively. Uh, the economy and jobs, how do we grow jobs, restructuring, uh, how do we structure Nigeria so that it works for all of its people, uh, healthcare, education, agriculture, and tourism. So as you would notice, so one of the first things we did was we looked very critically at the issue of power. Um, normally, power would be considered as part of infrastructure. But Nigeria's power problem is so terrible that we thought we would be doing it injustice if we rolled it up into power. As you know today, we have a minister of power who doubles as a minister for housing and who doubles as the minister for works. So he's a jack of all trades and a master of none. So the first thing we did is we looked at power. So what, I, what you see here is on the left over here is a measure of the wealth of countries. On the right down here is a measure of their use of power. Anytime you see a line going that way, what it means is the more power you have in your economy, what happens? The more wealth you have, period. The more power you have in your economy, the more wealth you have. So the first thing we did is we did what consultants would call benchmarking. And what benchmarking does is we took different countries and looked at how much power those countries used per person. Anytime you see per person, you would, it's per capita. So per capita in economics is just per person. So here is Norway. Every year, the average person in Norway uses 23,000 kilowatt hours per person. In Brazil, the average person in Brazil uses about 2,600 kilowatt hours per person. Please help me find Nigeria. Nigeria is here. The average person in Nigeria uses 361 kilowatt hours per person. In fact, here we were being generous because we based this on 7,000 megawatts of theoretical capacity. Only 5,000 megawatts is used. We only have the ability to use 5,000 megawatts. So here is Nigeria. Let's look for some other countries. Who is Nigeria's class? We are in the same class with Sudan, people that are in war. We are in the same category with uh, Niger. Uh, where is uh, South Africa? South Africa is somewhere here. So while ours is 361, South Africa is 4,000, almost 4,200. The average South African has about over 10 times the amount of power we have access to. South Africa has 55 million people, and we have 5,000 megawatts. South Africa has 1,000 megawatts per million people. If we had 1,000 megawatts per million people, we would need 200,000 megawatts of power. We call bold. Because we've said we need 17,000 megawatts. If we had just as much power as South Africa, our need is 200,000. So we're saying in four years we want to do 17,000. And 17,000 in four years would be more than all the power that we've been able to generate since this ambitious. But guess what? Egypt just did it. 
Last year, Egypt, in 27 months, put in 14,500 megawatts of power. In 27 months under Assisi. So here's where we started. So our goal was, Nigeria shouldn't be here. This is the global average. The global average is uh, 3,651. So the, around the world, if you look at all the power usage, the average is about 3,125. So we said, look, we can't attempt to go as far as South Africa. It's too far, it's too much. We can't do 200,000 megawatts. But let's make sure we at least get to at least 40% of the global average. That's where the 17,000 megawatts come from. Can we do it? The answer is yes. So we looked at other countries that have done it. We looked at uh, China. China, by 1990, this is where their power generation was. This is 1990. You see how China's graph goes up. So China did some things. They told themselves we are too backward. We need to get things done. And so they made a few changes. Today, China has 1.5 million megawatts. We have 5,000. Okay? So we have 7,000 theoretical generation capacity. And one of the things we noticed was that one of the ways that China was able to grow, so if you look at this graph, you see that around somewhere around here, the graph starts going up. What China did in around 1996 was they came up with something called the Power Sector Public-Private Partnership Law that allowed private businesses under the guidance of the government to get involved in the power sector. And China, for a long period, was building over 60,000 megawatts per year of power. So we know it can be done. And I just gave you the example of Egypt where they put in 14,500 megawatts in just 27 months. We're saying we want to do 17,000 megawatts in four years. So our power sector plans are to add 17,000 megawatts of power. Today, we're at 361 kilowatt hours per capita. Again, this is average power use per person. In the future, when we add these 17,000 megawatts, we expect that Nigeria will have about 1,250 kilowatt hours per person. We would have almost increased that close to about four times. Uh, it, we would still, in the future, and our future being four years after Shoreless first term, we would still be lower than Brazil. We would still be only about a quarter of uh, South Africa, but we would be roughly 40% of the global average, which is where we say at a minimum we must get to in four years. If we are able to do that, so remember I told you that when you look at the economy of countries, the GDP, the economy of countries per person, and you look at their power use, it's a straight line. The more power you have, the richer you are. This is where Nigeria is. Now, when we do what we, be, what we want to do, so you see this here, in economic terms, it just means every kilowatt hour of power generates about $4.3. Why? Because if you have power, you are more productive. If you have power as a student, the more power you have, the more you can study at work. When power goes off, what do people do? If it's an industry that requires power, it's either everybody walks out and waits until power gets restored. So an economy with power is an economy that powers itself, period. So our expectation, now we don't claim, we don't make any claims about this, but if we move from here to here, what it means potentially is that by doing nothing other than providing 17,000 megawatts, we could potentially move Nigeria's economy by up to one to two trillion dollars in addition to where we are today, which is about 400 billion dollars. We could, just by providing that level of power, potentially triple our economy. We make no claims about that, we don't claim that benefit here, but we know that it happens in the rest of the world. So our infrastructure plans are very simple. Our roads, Nigeria currently has 202,000 kilometers of roads that are dilapidated, not maintained. We want to double that and take it to 400, over 400,000. Um, it has the potential of creating almost 2 million jobs. Today we have about 3,600 kilometers of rail. 
we want to modernize the rail infrastructure, and we want to get to over 7,000, we want to double rail infrastructure and get to over 7,000 kilometers of roads uh, in four years. That should be able to generate uh, over 500,000 jobs in construction and in terms of all the work that's going on. So we have said it over and over again, that his goal is to turn Nigeria into a construction site. Over the next four years, there will be over three million Nigerians doing nothing but being engaged in the construction industry. Building roads, building rail systems, uh, housing, 17 million housing units. That's the deficit. If there are about five people living in a house, that's housing for almost 85 million people. Uh, building those homes and all the work that, has to, that goes into that will employ over 700,000 people. Um, drinking water, only about 30% of Nigeria gets today uh, portable water. We want to double that over a four-year time frame. So, and then sewage treatment. Many of us don't even know what sewage treatment plants are. Uh, that is where you take the water you flush and you treat it before you send it down to a lake, a river, or a stream. We plan to begin to do that as well. So over four years, our plan is that our plan will require about $485 billion, um, and it will create just our infrastructure plan. We have said we're going to create over 5 million jobs. Just infrastructure alone will take us to close to, well over 3 million, close to 4 million jobs. So we want to double our rail and road infrastructure. Those who think it's ambitious, guess what? Here is Nigeria today. We have about 200,000 kilometers of road. You know what that means? It means for every square mile of the country, we have only 0.57 roads. You know what South Africa has? 1.59, almost three times what we have. Um, if you look at rail, we have 3,000, just about 3,500 uh, kilometers of rail. That's 0.01 kilometers per square mile. That is how planners think about your infrastructure. South Africa has four times what we have. Our goal? is to get to about half of where South Africa is over the next four year time frame. Why are we picking South Africa? You must pick. We don't want to go beyond Africa. But we also, at a minimum, must set for ourselves achievable targets, but we must also have, uh, we must also have, thank you very much. So we must set achievable targets, but we must also have what we call peer economies. So one of the things we're doing was we were saying, well, what are our peer economies? We're not trying to become the United States in four years, but at least we should be able to get to half or one-tenth of where South Africa is. We should be able to beat Ghana. We should be able to do what Rwanda is doing. So that's, so every now and again, you might see us compare what we're doing to other countries. Uh, one, it is to make sure that we're being realistic in our plans. But secondly, it is also to remind ourselves that these things are possible. In the housing sector, we've already talked about the fact that we want to build about 17 million new units. Shoure has been very clear about the plan. The plan is that the average Nigerian will be able to access up to 2 million naira in loans, payable over 20 years. It means that no Nigerian that accesses these loans will have to pay more than 20,000 naira per month. That is part of why our minimum wage, our living wage, is 100,000. That out of the 100,000 living wage, if you're paying 20% of that maximum for housing, it still leaves you about 80% to get on with the rest of your life. So every Nigerian under our plan will be guaranteed up to 2 million naira in loans. And then we're going to establish something called the Real Estate Investment Trust. The government of Nigeria owns all the land. So the idea is, we know that for these 17 million units, we need about 8.5 million acres of land. Nigeria has about 250 million acres. We will all allocate about 8.5 million acres to this project. And we will monetize that and invest that into, as the seed fund, the beginning, the investment, into this real estate investment trust. And then we'll invite uh, the private sector to partner with us in that as well. Uh, living wage. We don't call it a minimum wage, it's a living wage. Here's where we started. So for those who wonder, how did you come up with these numbers? We looked at the entire Nigerian civil service. We looked at people from grade level 1 to grade level 17. A grade level 1 person, you know, every grade has tips. So the average payment in grade level 1 is about 20,000. The average payment in grade level 12 is 99,000. 
So only grade levels 1 to 12 in the civil service are below 100,000. So what we did was we said, what is the deficit? What is the difference between this and what we believe is the living wage of the 100,000? We identified that deficit and then we looked at what percentage of the civil service was in these categories. We found out that of the 900,000 validated employees in the federal civil service, that about 67% of them, um, almost 70%, so about 60,000, 70,000 people fall into this. Our estimation is that we'll need about $1.4 billion in addition to make those payments, uh, which would be about $490 billion added to, to our budget. We expect it to actually boost the economy. If I give people that already have 10 homes an additional 100,000, they will spray it within one minute at an OMA party. If I give a worker that was earning 20,000 naira, an additional 80,000 naira, what's he going to do? He's going straight to the market to buy a few more pieces of meat, which means the person who has a poultry is going to have to generate to have more chicks, more goats, maybe more cows. He will go straight and start buying more clothes for his children, which means the tailor gets to work, which means the person selling fabrics gets to uh, basically get more revenues, right? It means that they can now afford maybe to go to a school of their choice, which means that there's a school somewhere that will get an additional student, which means there might be another teacher somewhere that's potentially going to get hired. So we believe this is a stimulus. It's actually going to stimulate the economy. So in terms of our economic programs, that's the E part of Spice and Meat. The plan is to create um, over 5 million jobs, and when you see what the breakdown of those jobs are, we want to leverage technology for growth. We already talked about the silent T at the end of Spice and Heat. Every single program we have, from security to tourism, has technology inside of it. So when you look at our plan, you may not see a separate sector called technology. But in security, we plan to use drones, for example, to surveil what is going on in the Boko Haram areas. We plan to use intelligence to make sure that we stop corruption, cashless systems, putting the entire Corporate Affairs Commission database online, things like that, um, integrating, as Shore very brilliantly answered during the debates when people were asking where the data was. Nigeria already has a lot of data. Nigeria has more data probably than any other country. We have a BVN that is biometric. We have a voter's ID card that is biometric. We have a national ID card for those who have it that is biometric. If you own, we have a passport for those who travel that biometric. But if you speak on a cell phone, and almost every Nigerian does, we also have biometric level information about you. No other country has that level of, of information. If you try that in other countries, you will have issues with privacy. But clearly, we don't, uh, those aren't issues there. But we have all that data. If we have all that data, we should be leveraging it to grow our business. So the three plans of our economic program is leverage technology for growth, promote small businesses, strengthen the manufacturing sector. Uh, under leveraging technology, we want Nigeria to be the hub of software development. We want it to be the hub of ICT, not just in Africa, but around the world. Uh, Nigerians are doing this in other countries. There's no reason why we cannot create the enabling environment here. Our power plan will help this. So our plan for power is not to build one big plant and put it on one national grid. It's going to be decentralized. The 17,000 will be 500 here, 1,000 there. And the way we we'll prioritize where we build this, where are the ICT centers going to be? We're going to build hubs. We're going to be the innovation center. So that's, that's the plan that we have as far as technology is concerned. We're going to promote small businesses. It's not big companies that, that create jobs. It's, it's many millions of small businesses. If any of you has an idea today, how are you going to get uh, money to start? Nobody's going to give you capital unless you happen to have a, a wealthy parent. And most times when you have a wealthy parent, you don't even bother about starting a, starting a new company. You're just waiting for them to hand over their own company to you. So our plan is to create small businesses. We're going to develop something we call a small business innovation fund. We're going to put seed capital. Non-equity means the government wants nothing back in return except for 
Um, so we know it's risky, but just a small subset of businesses that qualify, the ideas are innovative, they're trying to do some new, remarkable things, develop apps where nobody is, everybody is afraid to touch you with a 10 foot pole. Uh, some of those businesses are going to be supported. Um, we're going to be training, providing training for small businesses and a new bureau for small business enterprises whose job will be to do nothing than to drive growth, help people build small businesses and provide them with training to do that. Uh, and then there will be lots of incentives to support that. And then the manufacturing center uh, sector, we want to boost uh, manufacturing in this country. Uh, if you think about it this way, in many industries, most of what you use in manufacturing is power. So if you are in China, your power cost is about uh, four or five cents per kilowatt hour. If you're in Nigeria, your, your cost is 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Why? Because you have to use your diesel generator to be supplying power. Before you even produce the product, your cost is already almost 100% more than the guy from China because we don't have power. So we're going to change that with our, with our plants. And then you can't strengthen manufacturing if you don't tackle corruption, so we're going to be pretty there. Nigeria has over 20 million cows. Those cows, the reason why you see all that fighting is because Boko Haram has closed off normally. Nigeria's cows spend the rainy seasons, they spend the dry season in the north, and then move towards here, sorry, they spend the rainy seasons in the north, and then move towards here in the dry season in the north. But now, 20 million cows cannot go towards the northeast because of Boko Haram. You take your cows to Taraba, Bauchi, Yobe, Adamawa, you have just donated your herd to Boko Haram. You take your cows to the northwest, you have just donated your cows to bandits in the northwest. So that's almost 30% of Nigeria they can't go to. Part of what is happening is more, there is more conflict between growing herds of cows and the fact that where farmers didn't used to see them before, now you are bumping into farmers everywhere because it's shrunk. Add to that climate change that is reducing yields, reducing water. So for us, it's an opportunity. We need to move these cows into ranches. We estimate that we will need about 2.5 million acres uh, of, uh, of ranch land. We're going to create those in five hydrologic zones that have natural sources of water. Um, and we believe it can generate about 250,000 jobs. How? There will be about 10 cows per acre. And each 10 acres, we will allocate to one person to manage. That means we have 250,000 plots, allocations. That's 250,000 jobs, first order jobs. Their job is to do the planting of the grass, as the cows eat it, pack up the shit. Or the manure, if I'm being linguistically, um, linguistically correct. But then guess what? That cow manure from 20 million cows, when they are packed together, can generate a thousand megawatts of power. So part of our power plan is to actually use that. That's what people do. In fact, part of what I do in my job, um, where I work, is to turn people's cow manure into power. So it's easy that people do that all the time. Um, and now we've not even talked about other industries. Leather, tanning, uh, something we call rendering. Um, and then if I have 250,000 people working somewhere, their families alone, three, four people, it means we will have probably over a million people in those ranches. Now we need schools. Now we need security. Now we need food. Now we need lodging. We need houses. You've just created another boost to the economy around those. So we think there's opportunity there. Healthcare, today only 30 million Nigerians are covered. We want to cover all Nigerians. Uh, they are covered under NHIS, only 30 million. We want to cover everybody else. So what we set aside, and Shoure was very, very particular about this, he, his charge to us was all Nigerians must be covered. So we've set aside, in addition to the health budget, a, an allocation of 2,000 Naira per person. 200 million people, that means 400 million we've set aside. Normally, only about 10% of the people fall sick. So if we set aside 2,000 per person, it means the average Nigerian, whether you have a job or not, you have access to almost 20,000 Naira per year to see a doctor, to get basic drugs for a mother who are just giving birth, antenatal care, and things like that. So every Nigerian is going to be covered. We call it universal basic health coverage because it's not comprehensive, but we believe we have to start somewhere. We can't, a healthy nation is a wealthy nation, period.
And then we plan to add on day one, 160,000 new jobs. So the goal, the charge from Shawere was how do we cover them? Uh, the plan we came up with that was sustainable and that was self-sufficient was to have at least 200 uh, new healthcare workers per local government area, 774 local government area, that gives you about 160,000 new jobs in healthcare. Agriculture, the plan from day one is, they um, want 774,000 new jobs minimum. We're going to create a thousand agricultural entrepreneurs in each local government area. Whatever that area, if it's the river Nile areas, if it is agriculture, if it is, uh, you know, horticulture, we'll support that. Um, so the idea is, and it's not all farming jobs. There are some jobs that is processing, you know, so it's basically anything in the agricultural industry will enable that, will provide them with training. For one year, we will support them with about 50,000 naira per month because it takes time to set up a farm. It takes time for you to actually start growing things back. It's a, it's, we're not giving the money to them, it's a loan. We're going to get it back eventually. But the federal government will begin to do things like, if I have 774,000 people buying something together, that is a massive group of people. It gives you supply, you know, it gives you purchasing power, the ability to get uh, good deals. It allows them maybe to share tractors rather than have each person use, use a tractor. So the idea is to become extremely, extremely involved in making sure that these work. Tourism is important. We, we believe it's, uh, you know, right now Nigeria is exporting its culture. There is no place you go to where people aren't listening to Whiskey, aren't li listening to Tiwa Savage, are not watching Nollywood. Um, we are rich in culture. Our diversity is actually a strength, but nobody wants to come back. Even those of us that are Nigerians, that are overseas, there are many Nigerians who, don't, who are afraid to come back to their own country. If our own people don't want to come back to their own country, how much more people that are not Nigerians, but they want to come, right? If the 20 million people in Nigeria, just the ones that are our citizens, if only 1,000 of them came, that is about 20 billion. If, if, if they only spent 1,000 naira, that is 20 billion. And you know they will not come here and spend 1,000 naira. Right? They will not spend 1,000 naira. So there's a lot of opportunity that we're looking at if we can actually grow tourism. So in terms of the summary of projects and costs, we want to have a responsible government. Again, show less charge to us for security, self-sufficiency, and uh, sustainability. So we create about 5 million jobs, and this is where all those jobs are coming from. And this is a minimum, because we've not counted those secondary other jobs that are going to be created as well. This is the additional amount of cost. So not all these jobs add to the federal government's cost. So jobs in road infrastructure, who is paying for it? It is wherever those construction companies are that are hiring the workers that are doing that. Um, all that the federal government will be doing in this case is getting either providing the capital or helping to ensure that we bring in people that can help provide the capital. So that's, that's our project. So where is the money coming from? 500 billion over five years almost, it means we're trying to spend about 100, over, a little over 100 billion dollars a year. So where's the money coming from? One is we'll reduce wastage. It might be a little hard to see, but what I have here is the millions of dollars you use to construct one kilometer of road. This here is the Bible Capital Township Road. These numbers are from the World Bank, by the way. It cost them about three point three. It cost them about uh, one point. So that's about three point seven. Three point seven million dollars per kilometer for that road. The Lekki Ekwe Expressway cost them about five point nine million dollars per kilometer. The world average is 1.4. So, you know where the rest of that money is going to. It is waste. If we're building roads, or if you're building roads for the Nigerian government or the Ishobre government, guess which cost you are going to be to be providing those roads at? It cannot and should not exist a global average. Okay? So we can reduce wastage. We can boost revenue collection. What you have here are Lagos' revenue numbers. So the Shoray government is not going to increase taxes, but we're going to make sure that those who gain the most from Nigeria are going to give back to Nigeria. We're not going to allow a situation where somebody gives 10 million and you get uh, uh, revenue workers to look the other way when you should actually be paying over a hundred, about a billion, and you give them 10, 
10 million and everybody looks the other way. The Shoren government will not do that. Lagos, Lagos was making about 1.1 billion per billion per month. Today, Lagos makes about 34 billion per month in internally generated revenue. In fact, Ambo Lagos gave a budget of almost 900 million. Nigeria's budget is about 9 trillion, which means the budget of Lagos alone is about 10% of the Nigerian budget. So we know that if you are serious about revenue collection, especially from the big boys and the big girls that fleece this country die and refuse to give back, uh, we know that one of the countries that has used public-private partnerships the most is actually private partnerships in over 13,000 projects. Uh, so we will leverage that, but our concern is going to be to ensure that the Nigerian people are not shortchanged in any way. Uh, Where is the money coming from? There are three ways, as I told you. We want to get uh, close to about $100 billion a year. Five to six billion dollars of that is going to come from tackling corruption. Today we know that about 20% of our budget is, is, is consumed. 25 billion, 30 billion budget, that's five to six billion dollars a year. We'll close that right away. People who need to be in jail will be in jail. People who need to be, uh, you know, going to court and, and getting prosecuted for their crimes will be getting prosecuted for their crimes. But this is what you would call in economics low hanging fruit. The next place is revenue collection. I showed you the example of Lagos. So today, tax uh, collections in Nigeria, revenue, is only about 6 The sub-Saharan average of all the countries around us is actually higher. It's about 16%. So we'll make sure that, again, no new, not one single cent in new taxes, but making sure we collect what is already on the books. What will that do? It will take our budget from 25 billion, take our revenues rather, and we intend to have a balanced budget on an annual basis the reason why I might interest, we're going to boost that by another 50 to 60 billion, so we're already close to 70. And then the balance of what we need to do, we can work with public-private partnerships, making sure that the policies of a Shore government protects the Nigerian people. The Chinese have been able to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure that we have been able to see the human face of the plan of the Shore Reform as far as business is concerned, as far as the Spicer Heat is con concerned. And let me do a little bit of, um, let me paint a little bit of a picture here on what has been happening before, because from what you've heard now, it's like music to the ears, it's rhythmic. ...and extortion that they carry out. So how do you expect such a civil servant or civil service to function you know, in accordance with you know, your trained as, as, as a leader. That's why we're proposing a living wage. So that we don't have to deal with all of those encumbrances of people being hungry and not being able to give their best. That is first. And of course the rest of it is dealing with ensuring that the rules are respected of punctuality, of capacity, of discipline. Uh, because that's why they are called civil servants in the first place. <laughs> it's because they are supposed to serve uh, the public. But the civil servants we have in Nigeria today, they are not civil and they are not serving anybody. That's the truth. And they set to bring about a government that can ensure that uh, there's some kind of civility is restored to that chaotic place that you will not have. On the issue of uh, building hubs, uh, it's, there are a lot of ways that government can build hubs. You don't have to construct physical hubs. But one question you should ask yourself is, would Andela be doing better if Nigeria had electricity? Can you compete better? And if it does, who builds electricity? Most countries around the world, the government is in charge of those kind of infrastructure. And government can also give you land. Government can give you, you know, uh, uh, interest-free loans. You know, in the U.S., a lot of, even the grants that we get as NGOs, they somehow come from government in a way because when you're doing good, when you're a foundation, the government says, don't pay me taxes. So the taxes we're not paying enables you to give more grants to people. If government were to you know, charge taxes on every NGO foundation that is out there, then so many of this you know, good, I mean, uh, foundation funding that we get would not come to us because they will be diverted towards taxes. That's, so that's how government function. We understand how government should function. I don't think it will be necessary to build hubs, but government can give you land. 
government can give you grants. There can be a technological, you know, pot of money somewhere. Put aside by Nigerian government to create innovation, to ginger the innovative sector. And the moment that happens, government is building. Why individuals are operating within enabling environments that will make them very creative and innovative. And there's no country that can afford to overlook that. We, were, we had that same argument in some of our, our interviews with other candidates. And we've been able to make it very clear. We, we, we discovered that even candidates that introduced data collection did not know that data processing and analysis was necessary. You know, but they brag about it and say, oh, you know, I'm the one who introduced how to collect data. But what do you do with the data? So government is the one that can collect data. But individuals like NGOs, like yours, can process data, can analyze data for public good. So what am I trying to say is that when there's good government in town, the partnership between that government and every other person that is doing good becomes part of government bureaucracy as you know, uh, an impediment to progress and creativity. I hope I answered that question uh, well enough. Uh, to safeguard how certain documentation about revenue is transferred from person to person, that not everybody has access to them if they are not up to that clearance level. And a lot of uh, tech people are the back. We talked about uh, uh, the use of blockchain technology. It's not that it will solve all the problems, but it can help you with tracking revenue. You know, the TSA that they have could have worked, but the moment Buhari came, because of the corrupt nature of the people that brought him, they started exempting several agencies of God. So over five to ten accounts are already exempted from NMPC. The customer has own exemption. I heard that MP has own exemption. So by then they exempted all the big revenue agencies. TSA is empty. You know, and then you have to think about Buhari as a person who has little upstairs with due respect uh, to the man and then has no energy or the ability. You know, a mediocre leader who don't understand how to even track or monitor or supervise his ministers or who doesn't even have meetings with them cannot understand how his country is uh, operating. As you understand, there's also a medical dimension to it known as dementia. So the man forgets almost everything that's going on around him. How do you expect such a person to fight corruption? So it's part of the reason why the argument is also about the soundness of heart, I mean, head and uh, body. 
in this particular election, even though people are speaking in, uh, in hush tones about them. So the next, of course, is enforcement. There are a lot of laws that we can enforce. And that's where the issue of party membership comes in. The moment you start separating who's, you know, who, can, you know, who can be touched with enforcement from those who can't, based on their party membership cards, then you have destroyed your anti-corruption uh, fight. And that is why Buhari's own failed spectacularly. You know, each time even his own people are found, it takes forever to clamp down them. Look at the time they found the grass cutter and when they are prosecuting. And the only reason why they are prosecuting Mr. Grass cutter is because of his politically expedient. Otherwise, they are not interested. It's because of the Nohen, the CGN, uh, you know, scandal that they decided that, okay, let's look for somebody on our side to show to the public that we are not biased and they went and brought the grass cutter. There are bigger crimes, corruption-wise, going on in the Buhari regime, which we have covered. And they haven't touched, and they will never touch because it suits their own uh, agenda. I was saying one day, the, I think we did a report about the lady at the MPA, uh, what's her name? Adiza, uh, Balao Sman's daughter. And uh, she wrote that she wants to sue star reporters. And then she got foreign lawyers to write to Harry Potter that they sue us. And I said to myself, they said you are corrupt. You say you are not corrupt. Then you go and hire foreign lawyers to protect your reputation. Well, how are you going to pay the foreign lawyers? Is it not true corruption? There's no lawyer in America that will take less than six hundred dollars for you per hour. So the letter she wrote to me is already a ten thousand dollar letter. Where did you get the money from, Adisa? Do you have a cocoa farm? Or are you growing? You know, so this is how they don't understand that, you know, this is how you get yourself caught up in the whole corruption. It's clear that she's using public money to harass a media company. And that shows also that you don't even believe in our own, you know, court system. Otherwise, we, we wrote a story against you in Nigeria. Why go to America to look for a lawyer? Go to a judge here and sue so that we resolve it locally. But I'm just explaining to you how these corrupt systems work. The last thing is consequences. You know, if corrupt people are not punished as they should, forget about fighting corruption. And they have been able to demonstrate that they are incapable. Our justice system is incapable of dealing with very powerful people. And you cannot, there was a I think a senator was jailed, and he also is also running for senate, and it's also on the uh, campaign council of uh, President Buhari. That's uh, Senator Dari. He's supposed to be jail in jail. There was a deputy governor in uh, Adama was a governor who was sentenced to prison, and the, pre the prison service cannot find him in prison. We are still looking for him. How can you sentence somebody to prison and he's on vacation from prison? That's well, you know, but if it is to jail somebody who stole the governor's phone, 17 years, the man will rot there. So these are the four basic areas where we will close our eyes and fight corruption with. But most importantly, leveraging on technology, the moment your money doesn't get in the pocket of a thief, your problem is less. When they get the money, it's difficult to retrieve, even in America. The moment people steal a lot of money, what they call is the blue collar or white collar crimes, and it's very difficult to get because they will hire the most powerful lawyers to fight it. At the end of the day, take half, you take half, everybody goes to sleep. Make sure that thieves, there are policies in place that don't allow thieves to have access to, especially large sums of money. And if they do, make sure that you collect your thing back or you prevent them from moving them out before it's too late. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together. We need to um, focus more on why we are here, which is um, making Nigeria's economy consequential. You know.
some criteria have you looked at this you know holistically enough to say what are the things that people need to know you know when things begin to go wrong how will they be able to understand it and how will, will they be able to engage uh, thank you very much for that question uh, so one of the first things we did um, even before coming up with manifestos and policies was a conversation around how do we speak truth to power? Not just to the power that exists now, but to the power that will exist when, by the grace of God and by the will of the Nigerian people, the change, the true positive transformative change that we're looking for comes in. Um, so we decided to do two things. The first one was to start with a movement. One of the problems we have in this country is there is no ideology. I've made this case before and I'll make it again. If I go to the U.S., if anybody goes to the U.S. and you hear that somebody is a Democrat, without meeting that person, without knowing that person, I can tell you about 90% of what that person believes about God. for anybody else that's the truth that's what we believe that's what he told us to do so the reality is the movement continues the movement is our ideological basis and it is our movement that then became the basis for this this manifesto now the second thing that he requested for that's here is that if somebody doesn't make commitments then you can't hold them accountable We've told you how many jobs we intend to create. If Shoole fails to create 5 million jobs in 4 years, many of us will not vote for him again. So he has made what he wants to do public. He has told us that he wants to put in 17,000 megawatts of power. We can hold him accountable. He has told us that he will pursue corruption without fear or favor we can hold him accountable. He has told us he wants to create a, a thousand agricultural entrepreneurs in 774 local government areas, and after four years, we can ask him, where are those 774,000 entrepreneurs? He has told us he wants to create ranches. At the end of five years, we can find out, at the end of four years, we can ask him, where are the ranches? So part of what we are here to do today, part of the reason why Shoole and all of us that are in the movement are comfortable providing these numbers is because we want Nigerians to hold us accountable. Starting with him. And what is absolutism? This is uh, capitalist. This is this is that. There's nothing that is anything. You understand? Does it work? Those are the questions you need to ask. Besides, what is technology? We need not be afraid that it's going to take our jobs. We should ask ourselves the simplest form a definition of technology is the state of human knowledge. In other words, as the state of human knowledge improves on the government side, also your state of mind improves because you'll be thinking of where do I find myself on this? And based on the leadership example that they have put down, they are telling you that they are creating a platform upon which you can plug yourself into. In other words, you are relevant in this kind of arrangement. Nobody is going to be talking over your head. They are creating a platform that will find that you can find expression through. So when they say creation of jobs, it means creation of opportunities robust enough to find to give you comfort enough to express yourself. And that's what we've heard. I'm just translating in English.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Timmy General. Uh, my question goes to those because um, I'm from the diaspora. And I'm very particular about this question because these are not never been mentioned on the campaign trail, particularly because our campaign is all about bringing new change in Nigeria. So my question is, what are the plans for the diaspora in bringing the entry barrier into Nigeria? Because many of us want to come back home. We love our country. We only went there for greener pastors. So what is the plan of the campaign in trying to bring back all the dreams, the brain drain, the money and everything that we've, got, we've taken away? Thank you. The remittance into Nigeria was bigger than the oil received into the, from the Nigerian from the Nigerian government for one particular for several years. So the aspirants are bringing in over fifty billion dollars. All our tax receipts combined together is around thirty something billion dollars. So the diaspora community is Nigeria's new oil, if not good. But the problem is that. The Nigerian government don't have any plans or respect for the diaspora community. That is why we are still even arguing about whether they can vote or not vote at this time. And by the way, if the aspirants were to be allowed to vote in this election, we would have stopped so campaigning a long time ago. <laughs> but with regards to barrier to entry, uh, the reason we don't have too much of what we do for the diaspora is because people already accuse us as you know the diaspora party. And there's some kind of tension between people at home and people who come from home because you're always acting as if you know too much and people don't like that. And we don't want to be in their face saying or think, making them feel like, oh, we're better than them. But the Indian model is what we have looked at, how they brought home their doctors, their scientists. It was that they created steps by which they can come back home. And I said to you, the first step is to have a functioning airport. I'm telling you, nothing discourages you more in this country than to arrive at the airport and know that this place, I'm sorry to use the French word, is fucked up. You know? And as you are entering, it's muggy, it's smelly, you know, the Immigration officers, customs, everybody's like trying to put hand into your pocket. The moment you get out of the place, you don't want to come back anymore. If you have the luck or bad luck for bringing your children and they start telling you, Daddy, is this your country? Is this really your country? That one is another mental torture for you. But the other thing is also to reintegrate them in the area of housing. But if they don't have schools that they can send their children to, if they can't have fine hospitals, they can go to if they fall sick, even for a few days. There's no diaspora that is coming back. And one thing I can tell you categorically in ending is that most diasporas who went for greener pastors are stuck with brownish pastors now. They are in a hurry to come back home. They can't wait to come back home. People in diaspora are even more desperate to have a better Nigeria.
and they just can't wait for take it back and AEC to win the election in four days. And we have to thank you guys very much in diaspora. You know, we know you're watching us, and uh, you can't wait to come back to your country. As we said to you the last time, give us a chance. We're going to prepare a home for you to return to, and that's that's a promise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think this. Uh, do you have anything to add? No, not at all. Just what you want. They wash chemicals. Those chemicals they wash is goes into the ground. And her water, most of the people do borehole. There's nobody controls them. Nobody, there's no sanitization on all these things. So they continue drinking. Gradually, gradually, in another 10, 15 years, they continue dying. They have having certain public problems. When it comes to um, houses, building houses, I can see that we have fish, we have fish here. There's no hygienic. What can we do? To solve all these problems because there are things that nobody can take cognizance to, but gradually it's killing our people. So, what is your plan towards this? Uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Malcolm to, to answer the question because I, I want to go to the back too and do what you guys are doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. So, it, you know, I'll just repeat your question. So, the first one is you have hospitals, you have places where Diseases are being treated, they wash things, generate water, and it's just released into places where people living around, especially children. Because the, uh, sorry, sir, because the Chinese now, they are sure. washing those things in our That's farmland. Right. And then industries, and industries, okay, and then industries and then housing. So let's, so there, there are two key things that I think are related to your yes. question, and they are policy, they're both policy related things. So the first one is that one of the biggest problems we have in this country is that the laws on the books are not respected. Guess what? There are actually laws that prohibit factories from releasing toxic materials to the environment. Effluent. Effluent. Are those laws respected? The answer is, is no. Now, but there's another problem. Another problem is that if you tell me not to release effluent to the environment, then one of the things that you and the government should provide is the infrastructure, gutters, sewer systems, pipes buried under the ground, so that from each of those factories, as they flush or wash, nobody actually sees it physically. It goes into pipes. Okay, and they have collection systems. So what you will notice is that in our plan, in our infrastructure plan, we have something called sewage. Sewage is different from drinking water treatment. So in, in most societies, you have two pipes going into every house and every factory. There's one pipe bringing clean water from a drinking water treatment plant. There's another pipe taking sewage. And sewage is all these effluents and waste. So we, in our infrastructure plan, if you go to our infrastructure plan, we actually have, um, I think if you go, move towards the back, there's a table, uh, keep advancing, go back. Uh, stop here. So you see this right here? 
this sewage where we plan to have as many as almost a hundred thousand jobs uh, so this is intended to deal with that problem so what we intend to do with these sewage treatment plants is to provide those pipes and the collection systems to make sure that hospitals are not releasing water into the streets they are putting these little pipes that will take them to a treatment plant that factories are doing the same thing and then you mentioned something about housing. We want a country where there's nothing wrong with face me and face you housing. But we think every Nigerian deserves a reasonable, affordable, and comfortable home. And that is why we have a plan for housing. That guarantees, so our plan is to build 17 million housing units. The housing deficit in this country, the amount of housing that is not available to make sure that each of our people is in a comfortable, decent, affordable home. There are 17 million of those units. So of the 200 million Nigerians that are here, if in each house you have about five people, that's about 85 million Nigerians that could move away from a face me, I face you somewhere else. What is stopping them from doing that? They don't have the funds to do so. So our plan guarantees that everybody, every Nigerian that has a job, every Nigerian that is desirous of having a home, um, will be able to...